Authentic is sponsored in whole by Voice of Prophecy. The book of Genesis, far from being an ancient fairy tale, it might just be the most reliable document that you and I have from the very ancient past. Welcome to Authentic. Sean Boonstra explores real existential questions about the meaning of your life and how you can live a genuine human existence. Listen every week right here on this station or on your favorite podcatcher. Here's Sean with this week's episode of Authentic. A lot of 21st century people, and tragically even some Christians, are likely to describe the book of Genesis as a myth. Now, that's not exactly the same thing as calling it a lie or a fairy tale, because that would imply that Genesis is nothing but fiction. A myth is just a little bit different. It conveys some kind of message about the nature of the universe, and it doesn't necessarily have to be historically accurate. So when scholars call the book of Genesis a myth, they're not necessarily suggesting there's nothing valuable in there. They're saying that somewhere in the pages of Genesis, you can find some kind of truth, some kind of higher principle that teaches us something useful about the nature of reality. Now, of course, as a Christian and a minister, I don't think of Genesis in those terms. Personally, I believe we have real history in the book of Genesis, and that would include those first 11 chapters that talk about things like the creation, or the flood, or the Tower of Babel, and so on. Now, in 30 minutes or less, I'm not likely going to convince anybody that my position is reasonable, that it makes good sense to take the book of Genesis at face value. But for today, I just want to underline one important concept that might help you start to take what the book of Genesis says just a little more seriously. And to help me make that point, I'm going to borrow a little bit from the work of Francis Schaeffer, the famous 20th century evangelical philosopher who helped a lot of college kids in the 60s and 70s find their way to a reasonable belief in God, a logical one. Now, honestly, I'm not positive that Schaefer would have taken the first 11 chapters of Genesis' actual history. I think he might, maybe, have leaned a little bit in the direction of theistic evolution, which teaches that God created this world through the evolutionary process. So if that's true, we wouldn't be in harmony on that front. But when it comes to the practice of epistemology, or the study of how we know that we know things, I think Dr. Schaefer was on to something. He wrote a number of books dealing with the existential angst we find in our postmodern world, including Escape from Reason, and He is There and He is Not Silent. And, and I guess I'm really fond of those books because they were part of what helped me on my path to becoming a Christian a long time ago. Some of what he says makes a whole lot of sense, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But before we do that, let's actually go to the Genesis account and look at something really important. In Genesis chapter 1, as most people know, we have God speaking the universe into existence. And we often use a Latin term to describe how God did that. He created the universe ex nihilo, which means He made it out of nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing. That stands in stark contrast to some of the ancient pagan creation myths, which have the various gods giving birth to this world and the human race from pre-existent materials. In fact, the pagan myths usually try to tell us where the gods came from, because to the pagan mind it seems unthinkable that the gods didn't have some kind of a beginning. So, for example, we have the Enuma Elish, the ancient Babylonian creation story, which says that the creation of the world happened because some prisoner gods were complaining that they had to work. They were out digging irrigation canals under the hot sun. They eventually got sick of that and mounted a protest. So a great conflict broke out, and before the war was finished, you had Marduk, the chief Babylonian god, making this planet from the dead body of a primal goddess by the name of Tiamat. And the human race, they said, came into being after he mixed the blood of another god with clay from the earth. But then you get the Genesis account, which describes a completely different kind of god. It never explains where he came from. He's just there, like you'd expect from a real god. And he didn't require pre-existent materials in order to create this world. 
The psalmist actually summarizes the opening of Genesis like this. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The pagan gods, by contrast, were really just kind of supersized human beings. They had personality quirks, they fought with each other, they toyed with the human race, and they were ultimately mortal. You could kill them. I think there's a really good reason that movies made by Marvel or DC Comics employ so many pagan religious overtones, including, well, Germanic gods like Thor. The gods of the pagans were an awful lot like our superheroes. They were outsized humans who had special powers, bigger than us, stronger than us, presumably smarter than us, but not all that different. The ancient pagan gods, it seems, were made in the image of man. But the God of the Bible is strikingly different, right from the opening words of Genesis. The author, Moses, doesn't waste any time trying to explain where God comes from. And when the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it's not just a declaration that the world had a beginning. It's also an indirect declaration that God did not. It says, in the beginning, God. He was just there. Now. It's important to remember that the book of Genesis was not written as an answer to Charles Darwin, even though a lot of modern Christians try to use it like that. When Moses first penned those words, Darwin was thousands of years into the future. What Moses is really addressing is pagan cosmology, the pantheon of gods that the pagans worshipped who were a lot like us and, morally speaking, sometimes worse than us. They were petty and capricious, unpredictable and incredibly self-centered. That's the universe that Moses is trying to disprove, dispel. But there's another concept that the book of Genesis is refuting, and it's a concept that underlies an awful lot of Eastern religion. Now, I've pointed this out on other shows, but many ancient cultures believe that the physical world we live in is some kind of a colossal mistake. The reason we suffer, these people said, was because, well, we weren't supposed to live like this with a real physical existence. The pagans believed that a non-physical existence was preferable. They insisted that we should embrace the Grim Reaper when he comes because, well, it's better to live as a disembodied ghost. Shortly after the birth of Christianity, we actually had a problem with some Christian sects who imported those ideas into the church. They borrowed from pagan cosmology to suggest that maybe the supreme God did not actually make the physical universe, because they said the world we live in is so imperfect. They insisted that the creation must have been the work of a lesser deity, a being they called the Demiurge. It was a decidedly pagan way of thinking, and tragically, some of their ideas did manage to get a foothold in Orthodox Christianity, to the point where we can still see the remnants of that kind of thinking to this day. According to ancient pagan cosmology, and I use that word pagan as a bit of a catch-all term because it was actually a Latin term used by ancient Christians to make fun of their polytheistic neighbors. It was a way of calling them bumpkins or rubes. But I still use it because we don't really have a better catch-all word for those belief systems. I guess we could call them all idolaters, which would be accurate, but somehow that seems worse than pagan. So pagan it is. And according to pagan cosmology, the universe began as a non-material mind. The physical world was a downgrade from an ethereal existence, and so in a way the best thing that can happen to you is death. because. It releases you from the prison of physical existence so you can return to the great cosmic mind of the universe. But the God of Genesis is not just a cosmic mind, and the physical creation was not a mistake. And I'll be right back after this to tell you why. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. Sign up at BibleStudies.com today and start your journey of discovery. 
This is Authentic with Sean Boonstra and the Voice of Prophecy. There is a solidity, a reality to the book of Genesis that you don't really find in other ancient creation stories. It presents a very real God and a personal God who creates a very real world. And there is no hint anywhere that humanity was ever supposed to be authentically at home in any place but planet Earth. In fact, at the end of the creative process, right after the creation of people, God reviews the project and says, behold, it was very good. The later Gnostics would suggest that somehow the Creator botched it and that one of the reasons Christ had to come was to correct the mistake of creation. By following the teachings of Christ, the Gnostics said, you could escape the prison of physical existence. Scholars believe this is one of the reasons the Gospel of John spends so much time on the creation story. In the beginning was the Word, John tells us, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men." Of the four Gospels, John easily has the most impressive opening. It's using the language of Genesis, and it's making a really big point. Jesus is the one who created this world in the first place, and it was not a mistake. The Gnostics were wrong. They were teaching pagan cosmology and not the story of Genesis. The biggest difference between the God of Genesis and the great cosmic mind of the pagans? The cosmic mind was rather impersonal. It wasn't a who so much as a what. And they taught that everything that exists in this world is just an illusion, including you. Eventually, they said, we all realize that nothing really exists, including us, and then we are just reabsorbed into the great mind of the universe. But the God of the Bible is very personal. He's self-aware, self-determining, a sentient being who can actually communicate with his creatures. He is not synonymous with the universe, and the universe is not synonymous with him. God is above it and distinct from it. You and I are also distinct from God. We are made in His image, and our personal identity is real. It is not an illusion. We are not just part of God's mind. We have a real existence quite distinct from Him. Of course, the Bible also teaches that we could not possibly exist without God because He is the only source of life in this universe. In Him was life, John writes, and the life was the light of men. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul spells it out like this. He writes, For by Him, that's Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So without God, you couldn't exist. It wouldn't be possible. That's why sin is said to have such devastating consequences. You have compromised your connection to the only source of life in the universe, and the wages of sin then is death. But while we depend on the existence of God for our being, we're not the same thing as God. We are distinct with our own personalities. The God of the Bible is absolutely unique on the landscape of world religions. He is infinite, which is really, really important because that's how we can see that you and I are finite by comparison. I mean, in order to understand what it means to be finite, you have to have something to compare yourself to, something infinite. You have to have an external reference point. That makes our understanding of the God of the Bible the opposite from the way the pagans considered it. They had very human-like gods they made in their own image. But the Bible has the human race made in God's image. We are not identical with God, but there is something of God in all of us that makes the human race special, even noble. So in other words, the pagans determined what the gods were like by comparing them to us. And by contrast, you and I can determine what we are like by comparing and contrasting ourselves with the infinite God. It's an exercise that generates a lot of humility and awe, and you'll see that in some of the Psalms because they were written as the psalmist was awed as he contemplated the majesty of God. 
About 500 years before Christ, there was a Greek philosopher by the name of Xenophanes who started to get uncomfortable with just how awful his pagan Greek gods really were. I mean, they were petty, they slept around, they squabbled, they lied, they murdered, and they used the human race like a plaything. He finally came to the realization that these couldn't be gods at all, and because they weren't big enough to explain the existence of the whole universe, he suggested there must be one god who created everything. Now, unfortunately, we don't have much left over from his writings, but the fragments we do have demonstrate that Xenophanes was getting embarrassed by his paganism. He realized that his gods were made in the image of humanity. If animals could be religious, he taught, their god would look like an animal because they were making gods to resemble themselves. That's what we've been doing, Xenophanes said. But God, if you think about it, couldn't possibly be like us. One of the key differences, he said, is that the Creator must be eternal by His very nature. And we're not. Everything which comes into being, he said, is doomed to perish. And he insisted that the human soul might actually just be our breath. He was moving away from pagan cosmology towards something a lot closer to what you find in the book of Genesis. And he got there by using logic and reason. So now let's go back to the book of Genesis. The God it describes is big enough to account for what we see in this world. But at the same time, he is deeply personal, which explains the noble nature of human beings. It explains why the natural world appears to have order and design, and it invites us to use our gift for rational thought to go out and find God. And it was this idea that gave the Western world its appetite for science. The universe can be studied, we realize, because it makes sense. And the universe makes sense because it is the work of a sensible being. Go back and read the writings of the great minds of science, people like da Vinci or Newton, and you'll discover that they were positive there was something to learn out there because there is a God who can be found behind the creation. It's a concept that Paul underlines very carefully in his letter to the Church of Rome. I'm pretty sure you've heard this passage before because it's one of my all-time favorites. It's found in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 19. And Paul is talking about skeptics who reject the idea of God because they think there's no evidence. Here's what he says. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse." This is one of the biggest differences between the God of the Bible and the deities of other religions. The Greek and Roman gods eventually started to look silly because they were far too human, morally speaking. They were just too much like us. And those nebulous, fuzzy deities of the East, the ones that have no personality, that's a God who's completely unknowable. In most of the world's religions, all you've really got are some esoteric, mystical experiences that can't even be described in everyday human language. There is no reasonable approach to the cosmic mind behind the universe. You just can't get there by using simple logic. It's a little bit like the psychedelic trips that the hippies were taking back in the 60s. They would come back from this so-called profound experience that didn't make any real sense. They just assumed that they had broken free from the illusion of a personal identity and ascended to some higher plane. Never mind, of course, the fact that you needed drugs to get there. By contrast, the God of the Bible is knowable. In addition to creating the universe, He continued to interact with us. In fact, He actually speaks to us. Let me read you one of my very favorite passages found over in the book of Jeremiah, because I think it's one of the most profound in the Bible. But I'm right up against a break. So I'll read that to you as soon as we get back. Got kids? Get Discovery Mountain, a free weekly audio adventure to build their faith. Discovery Mountain, it's a place where the air is clear, so clear you can almost hear your imagination. A world of Bible-based wonder for kids everywhere to grow their faith and get closer to Jesus Christ. Discovery Mountain, free weekly content that'll inspire and engage. Listen anywhere you get your favorite podcasts, or at discoverymountain.com. This is Authentic with Sean Boonstra and the Voice of Prophecy. All right, just before the break, we were on our way to the book of Jeremiah to a profound passage that I love. In fact, you've heard me read it many times in the past. 
It comes from Jeremiah 9, starting in verse 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. The God of the Bible is knowable, and He's knowable because He communicates, and He communicates in more than one way. On the one hand, you have a collection of inspired writings, the words of prophets who conveyed the thoughts of God to us. But then you also have what some people call the book of nature. And as Paul points out, you can discover the Creator by looking at the things He made. They're literally covered with His fingerprints. That's the idea that gave birth to the scientific revolution, the, the idea that there was something out there to be discovered. And that's where Francis Schaeffer comes into the picture. Thomas Aquinas, he said, helped derail our authentic natural approach to science. And he did that by suggesting that human reason is autonomous. We can just use it to discover truth without including God at all. What we did at that point in history, Schaefer said, was divorce the two great realms of philosophical discovery. On the one hand, he said, we have the world of particulars. That's what he called it. The vast diversity of things we find on this planet, particular things. But then on the other hand, we find ourselves looking for the universal principles that bind all of those individual particulars together. Let's use your morning commute as an example. Let's say you drive a Toyota Corolla. That would be a particular, a single kind of car. But the concept of cars in general, that would be the universal. A car might be an SUV, it might be a pickup truck, but there will always be wheels and an engine and those kinds of things, the things that help define what a car is. Once Aquinas introduced the idea that we could use our unaided reason to discover truth without any reference to God, well, that's when we started to run into trouble. We could still use our reason to identify and categorize all kinds of things out there in the natural world, but we no longer had an overarching universal principle that tied it all together. We knew these things were out there, but we had no reason for their existence. We had a what without a why. And after adapting that point of view, what we were left with was a very mechanical universe, one that worked very well and was predictable, but now it seems to have come into existence by accident along with the human race. Without God in the picture, the cosmic machine still seems to work beautifully, but now for no good reason. Dr. Schaefer describes it like this. He says, if the intrinsically personal origin of the universe is rejected, what alternative outlook can anyone have? It must be said emphatically that there is no final answer except that man is a product of the impersonal plus time plus chance. We still believed that the universe had order and that you could study the order to learn things, but we moved away from a limited system where God could be outside of nature and intervene in nature when He wanted to, to a closed system that was nothing but a machine that just somehow came into existence all by itself. We were studying the particulars of our existence, but suddenly we didn't have a universal behind it. And without that universal principle, without a personal, infinite God who ordered the universe, humanity became nothing more than just a cog in the machine. We were no longer special. We lacked any real purpose. And because of that, our lives no longer meant something. But never mind, we were still convinced of the absolute power of human reason to discover just about anything until we started to understand the limits of reason itself. In the world of philosophy, we came to the point where we couldn't be certain of anything. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that studies how we know things, or to be more accurate, how we know that we know things for sure. I mean, here we are, gathering up data left, right, and center. We live in a world that is saturated with information. We take measurements, we do the math, and we declare that there are physical laws that govern the universe. But how do you know your data is good? How do you know that your measurements actually mean something? How do you even know that your existence is real? I know to some people these seem like really stupid questions until you realize that the last few hundred years of philosophy have been obsessed with them. I mean, right now, I think I'm on TV or the radio, and I think I'm talking to other self-aware, sentient human beings, but how do I really know that? And when I find myself listening to you, 
How in the world do I know that I really understand what you're saying? Of course, common sense tells us the world is real. Common sense tells us that when we talk, we are actually communicating with somebody else. So our daily experience suggests that the philosophers are probably wrong. There is a real universe, and I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Voice of Prophecy's free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the prophetic mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and the world around you. You can study online or request them by mail. Visit BibleStudies.com and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Welcome back. It's Authentic with Sean Boonstra and the Voice of Prophecy. It stands to reason that I can believe you exist because when you talk to me, you communicate ideas that were obviously not born in my mind. They're new. Experience teaches me that you really are there. But modern philosophers have really struggled with that, to the point where they say, finally, like Albert Camus did, that the universe around us is really just absurd. It's an idea that has made its way into Christian thinking, unfortunately. And so now I'm thinking of people like Soren Kierkegaard, who suggested there is no way to rationally study the existence of God. All we really have, he said, is a leap of faith with no requirement for logic or reason. But as smart as Kierkegaard was, I would have to say that is not the position of the scriptures. The Bible says the universe is knowable because there is an infinite personal God who made it. And because his work is knowable, he is knowable. And if God is knowable and we are made in his image, then you and I can be knowable too. We can figure out what it means to be authentically human. We are not just cogs in some galactic machine, meaningless parts of a universe that don't have a reason for existence. Right now, we have come to a point in human history where absurdity is actually the prevailing theory. But think about this. Human beings have built this incredible civilization, the most prosperous in the history of the world, squarely on the notion that the universe is knowable because God is knowable. But now we see our certainty crumbling in the face of a generation that says you can't know anything for sure and we no longer believe in objective truth. We struggle to figure out who or what we are to the point where we're making ridiculous leaps into absurdity and now we're inventing identities for ourselves that defy all logic. What we're doing now is reaping the long-term consequences of rejecting a personal God. We prized personal freedom instead and tried to liberate ourselves from God-given morality. We thought it might make us happy, but obviously it didn't. You know, it might actually be too late for Western civilization, but it's not too late for you. Maybe it's time to go back to the claims of the Bible because maybe it's exactly what your heart's been looking for. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Sean Boonstra, and you've been watching another episode of Authentic. You've been listening to Authentic, sponsored by Voice of Prophecy. Remember, you can listen every week right here at the same time. And thank you. Authentic is funded by listeners just like you. You can support at voiceofprophecy.com. That's also where you can find all the episodes you missed or where you can listen again. That's voiceofprophecy.com.